This video is about remedies, damages and injunctions in the law of tort. So the main remedies in tort are damages with the aim to put the injured party back into the position that they would have been if the tort hadn't occurred. And damages are always going to be the main remedy for tort. So that's going to be a financial damages, a financial settlement in order to make up for the tort. Injunctions are a court order instructing a party to either to do something or to refrain from doing something, to, so to stop doing something. And in tort, injunctions are most frequently used in cases of nuisance. So the aim of damages, as we said, is to put the claimant back into the position had the negligence or whatever the tort might be not occurred. So damages can be split into two different types. We have special damages. Uh, which are, is where it's possible to give the claimant exact compensation. So we have a precise money estimate uh, in the award of special damages. And the aim is to give full compensation. So things included in special damages are going to be things like uh, clothing damaged in the incident, medical expenses which incur up to the date of the trial, uh, loss of earnings up to the date of the trial, that you will have receipts and exact figures as to how much you have lost. General damages, on the other hand, are far more difficult to calculate because you can't put together an exact estimate. And the aim of these is to give fair compensation. So general damages are tricky in two respects. They might take place in the future, so it may be future losses of earnings, or it may be for something that you don't have a precise monetary figure, so the actual injury. So something that we need to think about for the claimant is mitigation of losses. And this means that you mustn't do anything to increase the amount of damages that you've suffered. So the claimant has a duty to take reasonable steps to reduce their loss. So have a think about this for a moment. Um, I work for a delivery company and another van negligently collides with my van causing damage. And I refuse any offer of help after the collision and I drive home with the door hanging off and a broken window. As I get out of the van, I cut my hand on the broken glass and whilst I'm driving, the door comes off and damages the suspension as it flies away. So thinking about mitigation of losses, what can I legitimately claim for? So my refusal of aid is regarded as negligence and I can only recover the damage caused by the collision and not the additional damage by driving home. So I'm not going to be able to recover anything for the cut to my hand, neither am I going to be able to claim for anything from, for the damage suspension because I didn't mitigate my losses by taking the aid when it was offered. So we have to look at some case law here. Um, in this particular case, our claimant underwent a sterilisation operation which was negligently carried out by the defendant and afterwards they became pregnant because it hadn't worked. The defendant argued that she could have mitigated her financial losses by having an abortion and therefore saving the cost of bringing up the child. And in this particular case, the court rejected this argument, stating that in the circumstances, it was reasonable to refuse to have an abortion. So primarily, your claimant must mitigate their losses, but there are going to be extreme situations like this one where they don't have to. So other bits and bobs that we need to think about, um, interim awards are damages which are given before the trial. So if the trial is taking a long time and there's a lot of issues to deal with, it may be that damages are awarded before the trial takes place just to tide the claimant over. Provisional damages, this is uh, given in the Supreme Court Act 1981, which gives the court the power to award provisional damages where there is a real possibility that the claimant will develop further serious injury or disease in the future as a result of this injury. The court can retain the power to award further damages, but the award can only be adjusted once. So provisional damages, your claimant would be given an amount now, and they may be given a further award in the future, so it would be adjusted if things get significantly worse. And structured settlements, so instead of having a lump sum, a one-off payment, a structured settlement is a regular payment. And there are tax advantages from taking a structured settlement. 
structured settlements are generally only allowed where it's really quite a large uh, sum of damages. So let's look at the structure of our damages in general. Now we've already talked about special damages for specific losses up to the date of the trial, which are easy to calculate because they're financial, and general damages, which are harder to calculate because they have no specific sum. We now need to have a think about pecuniary losses, which is to do with losses of financial things, monetary things, and non-pecuniary losses, which are non-financial losses. So as we said, just to pick up on special damages once again, they're financial losses, and they could include losses of earnings up to the date of the trial, as well as any medical bills if your claimant has decided to go privately. General damage is more difficult to calculate an exact figure. So thinking about pecuniary losses, so these are going to be financial losses. For example, your future medical expenses, your loss of future earnings. And this is calculated using the multiplicand, which is the net annual loss or expense, and the multiplier, which is a notional figure that represents the number of years that the claimant would have worked. So let's have a look a little bit more at the multiplier and the multiplicand. So this is the calculation that has to be done. And as you can see, there's an element of guesswork. We know what the claimant's net annual loss is. We know how much they would have earned today. And we may be able to take a guess at the number of years that they have left earning. The difficulty is it's unlikely that somebody will stay still in terms of the amount of money that they earn each year. And we don't really know how many years that they're going to earn for. So thinking about non-pecuniary losses. So these are non-financial losses, but we have to compensate with money. It's the only thing that the defendant has got at their disposal. Um, so they will be awarded for the injury as well as future losses, loss of expectation of life, loss of amenity, which is things that you enjoy, such as playing the piano, loss of faculty, which is the abilities that your body has, things like your hearing, your vision, and also an award for pain and suffering. So you can see from this slide that different types of injuries are given different levels of compensation. The more serious injuries, so we've got paralysis at the top that's around £200,000, whereas a broken nose with full recovery is around 1000 So contributory negligence, if the claimant contributes towards the situation, they won't be entitled to the full award of damages. So for example, if they're not wearing a seatbelt. Um, and as we can see, if the injury was completely prevented by wearing the seatbelt, then they lose 25% of their damages. Whereas if the injury hadn't been prevent preventable by wearing a seatbelt, then it won't be reduced at all. Aggravated damages. So these are damages awarded over and above that which is needed to put the claimant back into the position that they would have been in. And they represent an additional sum of money because the initial harm was made worse by some sort of aggravating factor. So if the defendant had also defamed and trespassed to the person whilst the incident was going on, then aggravated damages may be given. Exemplary damages are sometimes known as punitive damages, and these are designed to punish the defendant for committing the tort, and they're only awarded in very specific circumstances. So if we look at the case of Rooks and Barnard, Lord Devlin identified the circumstances where exemplary damages could be imposed. So oppressive, arbitrary or un unconstitutional action by the servants of the government, where the defendant's conduct was calculated by him to make a profit for himself, and where the statute authorises the paying of these exemplary damages. So moving on to nominal damages and contemptuous damages. Nominal damages is where there's little harm, but it's a valid case. And it's, it's designed to make a point. These damages are awarded where there has been little or no harm, and it may be a very small amount. Contemptuous damages is where there's little harm, and it's not a valid case. These damages are awarded where the level of harm has been low and the court believes that an action shouldn't have been taken even though def the defendant was liable. And these damages could be as low as a penny. Unlike nominal damages, contemptuous damages can be awarded for any tort. 
So moving on now to injunctions. An injunction is a court order that requires the defendant to behave in a certain way, usually to stop doing something or to start doing something. They might be prohibitory injunctions, and these instruct the defendant to not behave in a certain way, so to stop doing something. Mandatory injunctions are to instruct the defendant to do something and to rectify the situation. And injunctions tend not to be used for torts such as negligence or occupier's liability, uh, but they're more likely used for nuisance, trespass to land and defamation. So this type of injunction is uh, Latin for because he fears. And they may be granted, uh, as seen in Fletcher and Bealey, the danger must be imminent, the potential damage must be substantial, and the only way that the claimant can be protected is through this particular type of injunction. Looking at interim injunctions, these are also known as interlocutory injunctions, and they may be granted once an action has begun, but before the main court hearing. So the injunction will be to instruct the defendant to not behave in a certain way. This can be seen in the America case, so it must be of serious issue to be tried. The balance of convenience must favour the granting of the injunction, and if there's no imbalance, of, then no injunction should be issued. So, injunctions can be used as an equitable remedy, and there are three main maxims of remedy, so three main rules. So the one who seeks the equity must do equity. Briefly put, if you want fairness, you've got to be fair yourself. And equity does nothing in vain, so the remedy has got to have a point. It can't just be to try and punish somebody. And delay defeats equity. So if the delay is too long, then it wouldn't be fair. So to finish up and to test the knowledge that you've gained through this presentation, I'd like you to have a think about the question, what damages or injunctions would be appropriate for Ali and Taz? So the scenario that I'd like you to consider, and I would like you to consider both claimants, Ali is age 44 and he's a self-employed carpenter. Taz, Ali's girlfriend, is age 32 and she's a teacher. Ali and Taz were touring Snowdonia on Ali's motorbike. As they climbed a twisty mountain road, Ali was forced to swerve to avoid a collision with a car coming out of a side turning. He lost control of the bike and crashed. His motorbike has been completely written off. Ali sustained a broken arm and severe bruising. He will not be able to work for three months. But when the arm is healed, he should have virtually normal use of it. Taz, on the other hand, has sustained a much more serious injury. Her leg is cut and badly broken in three places, so that although she will be eventually be able to walk on it, she will always have a significant limp and a substantial loss of mobility. Taz was a keen member of her local tennis club, and the doctor advises her that she would not be expected to be able to play tennis again. The motorbike leathers that she was wearing are completely ruined. So hopefully you've had a moment to have a think about Ali and Taz. If we start with Taz at the top, so for special damages, the quantifiable losses, she's got her damaged leathers. She may have the receipt for those, so she'll be able to get the exact figure. And that was incurred up to the date of the trial. General damages, more difficult to calculate. She might have pecuniary losses, so these might be future financial losses, such as future loss of wages, future medical expenses. And non-pecuniary losses, so they haven't got a specific financial value. That's going to be the pain and suffering from the cut and the broken leg. She'll be able to claim for the actual injury and also her loss of amenity because she can't play tennis anymore. So if we think about Ali, we're told that in terms of special damages, his motorbike is completely written off and he has to take three months off work up to the date of the trial. General damages, he's got his broken arm and severe bruising. Pecuniary losses, we're not specifically told about future financial losses after the date of the trial, but again, that could be loss of wages, future medical expenses. And non-pecuniary losses, he's got his pain and suffering from the broken arm and the severe bruising, as well as for the actual injury itself. <laughs>